In this video, uh, I will talk about microfabrication, which uh, I have mentioned a lot already in, uh, in previous videos, but uh, now you're going to hear how it exactly happens and uh, what the methods are. Uh, this is relevant to biomems in general and uh, other fields too, but uh, our focus will be on uh, lab on a chip and, and uh, to a certain extent biomems type uh, devices. So we will talk about clean rooms first and materials, and then about fabrication processes in the next video. But now let's first focus on uh, clean rooms. So to do uh, microfabrication, you need a clean room. And a clean room, it can mean different things in uh, different fields. We focus on, uh, on, uh, on manufacturing. Uh, and we focus on uh, some, to some extent, on research and not pharmaceuticals or medical uses. So a clean room is a facility used as part of uh, specialized industrial production or research, including the manufacture of pharmaceutical items and microprocessors. Um, not just microprocessors, all kinds of microelectronics, but uh, this, this is a good uh, way to grasp uh, how it happens. So biggest chip producers, Intel, AMD, and so on, they have their clean rooms somewhere in the world where uh, they fabricate uh, processors on an industrial scale, but so does uh, ST Microelectronics. Uh, they also hire uh, some fabs uh, to produce their chips, and so does everyone else. Uh, clean room air has low levels of particulates because uh, uh, dust can uh, really negatively interfere with uh, the production processes that we will discuss in, uh, in uh, the next video. And the standard that determines the level of uh, allowed particulates is uh, this one, this ISO standard. Um, you have here a table of the different classes uh, ranging from um, 10 particles of uh, a certain size uh, down to a uh, couple hundred thousand of uh, even larger ones. So there are cleaner rooms, uh, which are cleaner than your average office environment, down to the level of really, really super clean, uh, clean rooms, where the air is kept clean uh, and additional measures are taken, which I will also show you. Um, clean room air is uh, kept clean by continuously circulating and filtering air through uh, HEPA and uh, other filters. Um, and laminar flow is used uh, most, most commonly, laminar flow is used uh, to, to uh, circulate the air and to, uh, to push out the, the microparticles that might come in with uh, objects. Objects and people are transferred from the outside to the inside through airlocks where they are uh, subjected to an air shower. Uh, you will see that in the next slide. Turbulent uh, clean rooms also exist, uh, but I have only encountered so far laminar uh, setups where the air is uh, coming from, uh, from uh, uh, vents in the ceiling and goes down with laminar flow to, uh, to vents in the floor, and then they are recirculated in the uh, supporting uh, unit of uh, the, or the, the, the air system of, uh, of the, the clean room adjacent to it, and is filtered through industrial grade filters. And this one is the air intake from the outside. So it's not enough to just have the best kind of filters, you also need to place your clean room uh, somewhere where it is uh, relatively clean anyway. So uh, in, in Hungary, uh, there was a discussion where to build uh, our clean room and the decision was made to build it on the mountain uh, next to Budapest. Budapest is a capital city, two million people, lots of traffic, lots of dust. At some point, uh, there was a discussion whether to build a clean room down next to the river Danube in uh, one of the most populated areas that was scrapped for obvious reasons. It would be very difficult to keep the air clean. You would need to replace filters very often. So 
in the uh, on, in the forest uh, on the mountain is much easier to to keep it more economical but clean rooms are really expensive and are difficult to maintain require skilled and trained personnel they burn through um, millions of uh, of euros um, just to be built and then hundreds of thousands uh, to be run so as i said entry it happens through an airlock with an air shower stage so uh, and and you need to wear special clothing not your outside clothes obviously uh, from head to toe in in high day uh, higher grades of uh, of clean uh, clean rooms so um this uh, kind of uh, of face mask is uh, is quite commonly required in uh, in higher grades of uh, clean rooms even with uh, eye protection and uh, and sometimes a built-in uh, metal mesh uh, which uh, protects against uh, ESD so electrostatic discharge then um, there's yellow light uh, which um, which is uh, to prevent unwanted exposure of uh, photosensitive materials that are used. Uh, we will talk about these later. Um, but yeah, protective clothing uh, must be worn at all times. Uh, and it doesn't protect you, it protects the environment in the lab and uh, the devices that you work with. So yeah, clean rooms are expensive. I uh, already uh, mentioned this. Uh, this is a very rough estimate, but uh, if you want to build a clean room of a decent size, it will be in the million euro range. And uh, you don't just need a clean room, you need the personnel, so additional cost. And uh, the time to get it running is a few years. So it's not something you can build from one day to the other. Um, that is why, uh, or partially the reason why we are having uh, some issues in electronic supplies right now. It's not very easy to set up another fab lab somewhere else. You have to rely on the ones you already have because setting up a new one takes a lot of time and money. Anyway, there is no clean room. And actually, I don't think there ever will be uh, at uh, the electronics department. It's just too expensive, uh, requires too much space. And uh, to be economical, it needs to run 24 seven, basically. So, but we have a cheaper alternative, which uh, is affordable to nearly everyone and costs uh, 10, 20,000 euros. It's a glove box. Still, when I say 10, 20,000, that is cheap uh, in terms of laboratory equipment. So, and you can buy used ones. Uh, it, it doesn't cause any issues if you buy a used one. So in a glove box, you have a positive pressure which means uh, the inside is kept at a high pressure and uh, that is to prevent dust from building up. So high pressure, if there's a leak anywhere, it goes out rather than uh, being uh, kept in. You can operate whatever's inside uh, through gloves and uh, the pressure is maintained through a pressure regulator. It's uh, usually with an inert gas like nitrogen or argon and uh, the like. Uh, objects are transferred through an airlock, uh, just like with a regular clean room. And uh, here the main expense is uh, the gas. So you need, you need the gas to, to keep it going and obviously you need to maintain the glove box itself also, that uh, it does not um, leak anywhere, because then, then you would lose the gas more quickly. So yeah, this is a more affordable version and it is used uh, quite often uh, to, to make high quality lab on the chip devices. And uh, yeah, it's, it's good enough for us. Uh, this we have already talked about, uh, but just as a reminder, microfabrication produces equipment in submicron to millimeter range, but we focus on submicron and uh, up to a couple hundred microns. 
MEMS, microelectromechanical systems, size range 1 to 100 microns, ones that we focus on, and the devices range from 20 microns to 1 millimeter. BioMEMS is uh, just biomedical MEMS. Microtas, we have mentioned micrototal analysis systems. In a way, it is synonymous with what Labonachip aims to achieve. And uh, Labonachip started in a clean room a long time ago with gas chromatography. And uh, yeah, analytical chemistry has been the driver of Labonachip for a long time. And uh, much of what uh, we use has grown out of high performance uh, liquid chromatography. Even the connectors we use, standard uh, connectors, have been used before or were used before in, in HPLC. Um, this one is an example of a microfabrication process. You will see this often if you go to this field. Um, you start with a substrate, substrate being in this case uh, silicon, and then the process uh, description uh, tells you how these layers are built up. The layers themselves are thin films, which are a few nanometers to a few micrometers thick. Um, these are material layers, different materials, whatever they may be. We will talk about the processes uh, in the next uh, video. And uh, these are the two things you need to remember. So substrate and then structural layers, which are typically thin films. They can be various materials. Uh, in this example, we have uh, a two-dimensional electrode array. It was uh, what I worked with in my master thesis. I will talk about this uh, a bit more in another lecture. So silicon, silicon dioxide, which is a good insulator and happens anyway. Whatever you do, there will be some oxidation on the silicon surface uh, with contact with air and especially the moisture in air. Then uh, photoresists, we will talk about these later. Aluminium, so just to give you an example of a metal layer and Teflon which in this case uh, is the hydrophobic layer on top of these electrodes. How it's made, you have various steps here. We will talk about what these steps are, but you see it's built up layer by layer. First silicon, then silicon dioxide, then photoresist, you will see why. Then metallization, then selective etching, then uh, again uh, oxidation for uh, insulating electrically. Then uh, again, selective etching, and then uh, uh, coating with a hydrophobic layer. You will see what these uh, steps mean in more detail later. So let's see pros and cons. This one is an HIV analysis device. It's uh, the size of my thumb, roughly. And uh, yeah, you can, you can check it out uh, in this uh, article. Uh, the level of integration that we have here is only possible with microfabrication. Uh, so, an integrated circuit that uh, is inside this device does, uh, in this case, uh, electrochemical analysis, heating, and, uh, and things like that to perform DNA amplification or RNA for HIV. Microfabrication gives you structures with high aspect ratio, meaning uh, the difference between smallest and largest uh, features. Uh, you can achieve good feature sizes under 100 microns, but it is best at uh, under 10 microns. You have a wide material selection. You have a wide material selection of uh, high quality and uh, excellent process control. Uh, it is possible to integrate directly electronics into your uh, Labona chip device or Biomems device in general. So you remember we talked about uh, uh, neural probes with uh, embedded microchannels. That is an excellent example because it is the right size regime. It is the right amount of complexity. It has fluidics, it has electronics, and uh, altogether it is a Biomems device, but also can be called uh, a microfluidic device in a way. 
It is cheap in large quantities, very expensive in small quantities. And uh, it's especially good for this uh, size regime if you need excellent quality. The cons, it's very expensive to make prototypes. It is kind of clean industry, but not really because of all the hazardous chemicals that are used. That's just to keep in mind. And uh, instrumentation for setting up a clean room, that's not something you want to do. So if you want devices like this and you are not in a large university which has a clean room, then you will need to outsource uh, your production to one of the fab labs in Europe. There are quite a few, so uh, one of them is, uh, is one of our partners in Hungary. I can personally recommend them for research purposes. Then um, for the substrate, so what you start with, base layer, foundational layer, you can call it many names. Typically it would be silicon or glass for us, both, both uh, in the form of uh, wafers, wafers meaning round discs. I'm not going to go into the production of uh, of uh, high-grade silicon. You can look it up or you learn it in other courses. That's not the purpose here. Purpose here is to keep it focused on uh, Lebona chip and biomems. Silicon, uh, as, as in the previous lecture I mentioned, is highly resistant to organic solvents, has a good thermal conductivity. Glass is also highly chemically resistant. It is generally chemically resistant. That is why we like it. And it's also transparent. The thing is, both are quite expensive. Uh, on the other side, silicon is not transparent and uh, glass is somewhat permeable to gas. So, but uh, if you want a really high quality lab on a chip, microfluidics, biomems kind of system, you need to start with these and the end result will likely be a structure of silicon and glass or glass and glass, depending on uh, what you want to achieve, transparent or non-transparent uh, systems. And this will be highly tolerant to pressures, highly chemically resistant, so best in applications where multiple uses are needed or a high pressure tolerance is needed or you need an excellent quality. Now, um, let's talk a bit more about uh, what the layers can be. So as I said before, structural materials are typically thin films. If you look at this more close up, substrate, thin film, has a thickness of uh, something, a couple hundred nanometers to a few micrometers. Substrate itself is uh, thick compared to the thin film, a couple hundred microns. In the case of uh, four inch silicon wafers, 500 uh, something micrometers. And uh, most commonly used thin films, silicon dioxide, uh, good for insulation, also used often as, uh, as masks and uh, sacrificial layers. You will hear what these mean. You will also see the, the process steps that can create this silicon dioxide. Silicon nitride, good electrical insulator between uh, different conductive layers. Uh, you can etch silicon nitride highly selectively. You will see what that means later can also be used as a structural support, which is particularly important in MEMS. Then uh, metal films, aluminum, gold, uh, platinum, they are typically used for uh, electrodes and uh, for wiring. Um, aluminum can also be used uh, as an optical, uh, as, a, as a mirror, basically, as a highly reflective layer. Then uh, there are also uh, conductive films, transparent conductive films, such as uh, indium tin oxide, which uh, conduct electricity, but are transparent. So in this first video about microfabrication, we talked about uh, clean rooms and we talked about materials 
used in uh, microfabrication. Mm -hmm.